Okay, uh, well, good morning, everyone. I want to get started here. We're a couple of minutes late. Uh, I'm Rob Atkinson, president of ITIF, and uh, really uh, pleased that uh, Mark Zachary Taylor can join us. Um, the format here will be Mark's going to give a sort of 20 minute PowerPoint. He and I'll have a little chat about some questions. We'll open up at plenty of time for questions, and we'll adjourn uh, no later than 1130. So when this book came out a few years ago, I, don't know, I mean, two and a half, three, yeah, two. two and a half, I ran across it. I was like, whoa, this is really interesting. So I bought it uh, and actually read it, and it was really interesting. Uh, and it's one of the uh, few books, or maybe, probably the only book that is really dug in in depth from a scholarly perspective. They really try to untangle why are some countries more innovative than others, and, and what are the factors there. And we all... If you're in the innovation space, everybody's like always speculating about that. You know, why is Israel so innovative, and why is Singapore so innovative, and uh, you know, wh wh why is Argentina not innovative? Uh, Mark knows, and he's going to tell us here. So, uh, and perhaps tell us a little bit about what that all means for the United States. Um, so he is uh, Mark is a pr associate professor at Georgia Tech in the School of Public Policy. He's a former solid-state physicist. Um, his book, The Politics of Innovation, I encourage you to get, 2016. Uh, he's um, been published in a wide variety of scholarly and, and other journals, uh, Foreign Affairs, uh, um, Review of Policy Research, Harvard International Review, et cetera, and he has a, a PhD in political science from MIT. So, Mark, take it away. Thank you. Okay. So, oh, we got the feedback on this mic as well. I'll hold this. So my name is Zach Taylor. Only my mother calls me Mark, but you're welcome to. Um, and I'm coming to you from the School of Public Policy at the Georgia Institute of Technology. And for the past 25 years now, I've been researching this question. Why are some countries better than others at science and technology? And in 2016, I put out a book where I try and synthesize 50 years of findings in this field together with my own research on the subject and published it as this book. Now, there's a lot going on here, and I'm happy to talk about it for hours and hours, if you like. But for the talk, I kind of cherry picked out the stuff that I thought would be most interesting and, and, and uh, perhaps controversial for this audience. So what I'm trying to do in my research is explain uh, findings like this. So this is a big mess. Don't panic. Let me tell you what you're looking at, and then I'll clean it up. So this is basically one way of looking at nations and how they innovate and how, how much they innovate. This is about 25 of the most innovative countries in the world. We're looking at them from 1975 to 2005. In the next couple slides will explain that time frame out. On the y-axis, we've got a patent-based measure of innovation, specifically patents per capita weighted by forward citations. And since the United States is by far the most innovative country in the world at this time, I just made the US equal to one up there, and everyone else is relative to the US. Now, let me stop and say uh, there's a lot of controversy about how to measure innovation. There's actually, I have a couple of appendices and have a uh, chapter in the book about measurement, measuring innovation. and they're all controversial. None of them are perfect. I use patents because people tend to get them. Uh, and I'll use them consistently throughout this talk. But all the findings I've found with patents, I've also found with other measures of innovations. Uh, science and technology research publications, high-tech exports, uh, capital formation, uh, all sorts of other productivity rates. And if you don't like statistical measures of innovation, I've got all sorts of qualitative case studies of various size sizes in the book. And they all point in the same direction, which is what I like to see. Um, so if you don't like the patents, there are all sorts of other ways to get at this. But you'll be looking at patents for most of this lecture. So let's clean this up a little. So I was able to break. When, I, when you look at the world's most innovative uh, countries, you, they fall naturally into three different groups. One of them is this group here, the most innovative countries in the world during this time period. Note that we expanded out now 1970 to 2012. Uh, which is how much we, uh, of the data I've got that has the, the qualities that I like about it, that give me confidence. And here we've got uh, uh, the U.S. up there is number one, Japan in red. We see it coming up from uh, where it's going into basic industries and steel and chemicals and innovating into electronics and computer chips and computing and biotech and aer aerospace and coming up to be one of the most 
innovative countries in the world, even beating out the U.S. by this measure for some years towards the end there. We see Switzerland here in purple coming down in a relative sense, but still one of the most innovative countries. Sweden in yellow, Canada in dark blue, and Germany in green. So let's take a look at the next group. And I want you to keep an eye on this 0.2 level here. Arbitrary measure, but it's, a, it's good for the reasons that you'll see soon. This next group is the dozen or so countries that I call mid-level innovators. Notice they're mostly below this 0.2 level. So let's go back and take a look. There's the most innovative, mid-level. So the y-axis scale, I try and keep the same between these two slides, right? And what we see here is a lot of consistency. There's, there's some jockeying for power, but not the big ramp ups or come downs that we see in this group up here, right? So we see Spain down here hugging the bottom, New Zealand in lime green. Uh, we've got, uh, uh, what is this, France here in dark red, or, or no, in dark red over here. This is Denmark in the, in the circles. Oh, that's it's France, sorry, Denmark and France. I got to still go back in the data and see what's going on with Netherlands right here, this pop-up. Is that an artifact of the data? Is that really something going on? But in general, we're not seeing a whole lot going on here. Rather, if we want to see real excitement, we go to this third and final group, these guys right here. So let's, here's that point two mark again. Go back to the mid-level innovators. Finland, Taiwan, Israel, Singapore, Korea. These are countries that are either in the mid-level uh, category or not even on the map in the 70s, and they take off, blasting their way through the mid-level up into the ranks of the most innovative countries, even uh, better than some of the most innovative countries. So why are these guys taking off, but not these guys? And what's going on with some of the declines up here? That's what I'm trying to explain. So I love this subject because you can talk about it with anyone. There are all sorts of great uh, ideas and hypotheses coming out from people even T tangentially related to this field, who are just having uh, looking around at economic competitiveness. And here are some of the top explanations that come out, not just from uh, people who have been interested in the subject, but scholars, policymakers, who are trying to explain why some countries are better than others at science and technology. There's the military explanation. This is the idea that countries invest a lot in developing military technologies, and then this spills out into the civilian economy, lifting up the entire economy. There's the size argument. Larger countries have more resources, more people, therefore more innovative innovators and more, innova more resources to innovate with, so you get more science and technology. There's the scarcity argument, usually scarcity of labor or natural resources. This is the idea that a country that is scarce in something will innovate in that area to try and compensate for that. So if you are scarce in labor, you're going to invest a lot in automation and robotics. If you're scarce in energy, you're going to invest a lot in nuclear power, etc. There's the barriers to entry or increasing returns argument. This is the idea that it costs a lot of money and takes a lot of time to build up an innovative economy. You've got to invest in all those universities, trade in all those scientists and engineers, create all those laboratories and all those firms. But once you get that innovative economy going, you can keep it going with marginal investments. You still have to invest in it, but it's a lot easier to keep it going and a lot easier to push out your competition because they have all that to build up. So the people at the, this says the people at the technological frontier, as long as they're investing, should tend to stay there. Then there's the free riding argument, which is the opposite. This is the idea that newcomers can beg, borrow, steal, copy technology from guys at the leading edge and then leapfrog ahead at relatively low cost and low risk. And then finally, there's the cultural argument. This is the idea that some cultures are just naturally inclined to be more uh, risk-seeking or risk-averse uh, or more geared towards science and technology rather than, say, religion uh, or other forms of economic behavior, socioeconomic behavior. And these always come out in arguments over innovation. So if, these, if any one of these is sort of an overwhelming explanation, then it should explain many, if not all, of our top innovators from that top slide. But they don't. So the military argument definitely explains the U.S. That's our story, right? Big investments into military research and development that spill out into the civilian economy and everything happens. Can't tell that story about any of the others, right? We're not talking about the great military industrial establishment of Switzerland. Uh, in Japan, the opposite is, is at best what's occurring. They invest in civilian, it spills out into the military. Size, we have two very large economies, U.S. and Japan two mid-sized economies with Germany and Canada, and then two tiny economies in Switzerland and Sweden. What's the size here, like five, six million people? These are tiny countries. 
but still they're among the most innovative. So size is not the big explanation. Scarcity. Well, honestly, you could argue that every country is relatively scarce in something or other. Uh, so it's not sure how rigorous an explanation that is. In fact, you could say the United States is the one country that is relatively scarce in nothing. We have plenty of natural resources, plenty of labor, plenty of capital. So if this was the driving force, we should have fallen off a long time ago and not been at the technological frontier. Uh, barriers to entry, increasing returns. This is the idea that once you create an innovative economy uh, at the technological frontier, you tend to stay there with just marginal investments over time. Well, if that's the case, then Great Britain should be on this list, right? They were at the forefront of the scientific revolution of the 1600s and the industrial revolution of the 1700s. And then they fell behind with the uh, second industrial revolution based a lot around chemicals and then around electronics and eventually computing and aerospace. They're still good mid-level competitors, as you saw in the uh, second uh, slide, but they're not among the top lead innovators anymore. And, uh, and honestly, if we're going to make this argument, then China should be at this. China was the top S&T country in the 1200s, 1300s. They nearly industrialized. They had the beginnings of a factory system. They had basic steel manufacture. They were the lead, world's lead S&T uh, society. But they fell behind so far that after a couple hundred years, they had to relearn a lot of their own science and technology from Europeans. So this isn't quite explaining it to us. Free riding. This is the leapfrog ahead by beg, borrow, or steal from more advanced countries. Definitely we can talk about that with Japan, with Taiwan, uh, with South Korea. There's a lot of reverse engineering and, and relying on uh, lead nations to get ahead. But if that were the case, then leading countries like U.S., Japan, Sweden should have fallen behind long ago. These are countries that have been the leading edge for a good 50, 100, 120 years. So if it was all about leapfrogging ahead based on the advances of others, then the ones who were ahead should have fallen back and been leapfrogged over, but that's not what we see. And culture? I can't find any common cultural trait between these different societies, right? On the, take the religious front, we've got very Protestant, very Catholic and a Confucius country. We've got countries that are very collectivist and countries that are very individualistic. So I'm not saying that these things don't matter at all. I'm saying they don't have a lot of, they don't provide a general explanation, right? They're not a silver bullet that's going to explain it to us. So what's next? So what's next is what political scientists and economists and policy people like, which is basically policy, domestic policies and institutions. After all, countries are defined by their policies and institutions. That's what makes diff countries different from one another. So therefore, countries with better policies should innovate more. So one of the first approaches at this is to look at this, it's called the National Innovation Systems Approach, is to get in there and look at different innovating countries and see what are the policies they're using to get ahead. So studies across the decades have looked at all sorts of different policies, things like uh, what type of patent system do you have, how open are you to free trade, to what degree are you subsidizing R&D, uh, uh, antitrust, defense, and I've got my dot dot arrows to indicate that over the years, uh, economists, uh, social scientists have examined dozens and dozens of these, so I could continue the list down the slide. Problem is that although a particular set of institutions and policies may explain a country at a particular point of time, it doesn't explain another country at the same point of time or even that same country a decade or two later. So there's no one set of institutions or policy that really seems to come out as winning. So let's just take the U.S.-Japan example, our top two innovators. The U.S. story is very much about military investment in research and development and uh, uh, technology, with the military also buying, being the first purchasers of these new technologies, and then that's spilling out into the civilian economy. Strong antitrust law that breaks up big behemoths like IBM or AT&T and allowing small firms coming from uh, uh, people's garages or spilling out from universities where a lot of cutting edge research is being done to sort of re-energize the innovative system. None of that is going on in Japan. Totally different story. We've got uh, uh, incredible government intervention to sort of bring in the technology from, and science from abroad, but stripping out, filtering out the foreigners themselves. Very cooperative industry labor relations where companies and labor are working together to develop and adapt and diffuse new technology. And corporate management techniques like just-in-time production systems. And if I put up Germany and Switzerland and Taiwan and other top innovators, you'd get still other policies and institutions, a proliferation of these. So 
on the explanation side, that's bad news because policy is great and it definitely plays a role, uh, but it's not giving us any general explanation. The good news is that co countries can customize, right? There's no single set of policies that a country must do, must adopt in order to innovate. Countries do not have to be like America or Japan or China in order to get ahead. They can design their own sets of policies and institutions to fit their particular circumstances, their economies, their politics, their history, their culture. So that's good news for policymakers. And again, I'm not saying policy doesn't matter, but there are lots of different ways in order to get there, lots of different policy combinations that you can use. And policies can be uh, 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 applied in different ways, and we'll talk about that later. So my next step was to think, OK, if the particular constellation of policies don't matter, maybe it's the general economic environment. Sure, countries around the world have embraced capitalism, but to different degrees, right? We all have different versions of capitalism uh, that we like, and some are more free market than others. And this is known as the varieties of capitalism approach. And the basic idea is that the more liberal market economies with more market forces, there is more risk if you don't innovate. If you don't innovate, you risk stagnation, falling behind, and losing your market share and profit to others. If you do innovate, you can get those fantastic profits and markets and build new, uh, entire new industry and get fabulously wealthy. So you, there's the incentives are all there for lots of revolutionary technological change. In more coordinated economies, uh, there's less market interaction. In some of these countries, you actually have government sitting down formally with labor groups and big business saying, OK, here's how much we're going to adjust prices this year and let wages rise. And here are the certain uh, 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 technologies we'll allow to sort of diffuse through the economy. There's more of a coordinated approach to reacting to changes in the economy. So there's less, there's more consensus. There are less rewards for innovating and less risks for not innovating. So we should see slower, more incremental innovation. Uh, problem is, and this has been tested again and again, we don't see this in the data. So this is just one approach, and dozens of uh, uh, people, including myself, have looked at this in different approaches. This is, again, a patent measure. We've got our more liberal market economies, our more coordinated market economies, and others in the 1970 to 2012 uh, period. So what we see is they're all basically grouped together. We've got the US way up top and Spain really down here in the bottom. But other than that, it's more or less the same. So liberal market economies, we've got US, Canada, Great Britain, Ireland, uh, Australia, New Zealand, coordinated market economies, Japan, Switzerland, Finland, Sweden, Germany, Denmark, uh, 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 Netherlands, Norway, Austria, Belgium, and the other, which are sort of mixed, Israel, Taiwan, Singapore, Korea, France, Italy, and Spain. Um, and you can play around with the classifications, which some people have attempted. And you still don't get positive results. It's basically a null set. Don't get me wrong. I love capitalism. I'm a big capitalist myself. All this da data says is that capitalism is neither sufficient or perhaps not necessary in order to become more innovative. So the next theory out is, OK, if policies are determined to a certain degree by the degree of ec competitive economic markets, you need a competitive political market in order to get competitive economic markets and good policy. And that's where we get into decentralization theory. The idea that democracies are better than more centralized systems. And within democracies, you want more decentralized democracies. That these are going to create that competitive political environment that are going to lead to good economic competition, the good institutions and good policies that foster that. And have people seen this book, Why Nations Fail? Great book. It's my white whale. It's my nemesis. I keep trying to shoot down because they're a big proponent of this, right? And they say that decentralized democracies are best, more innovative for all sorts of reasons. One, if you go to a centralized democracy like, say, Great Britain during the 1990s, right? If you get the prime minister's office, you, you control parliament and you control the prime minister's office and basically the whole country responds. They're, the local governments don't have a whole lot of autonomous power. So if you are, say, uh, big, big oil and you're trying to prevent alternative energy, all you need to do is influence a few key people in the prime minister's office, and then the, you've got, you can establish the taxes and regulations to keep this new energy uh, research and technology from coming in. You want to try that in the United States, you not only have to capture some people in the White House and in the, uh, both houses of the Congress, you also have to influence people in the state governments, in the governor houses and state houses around the country. And that can be incredibly difficult and expensive to do. So it's a lot tougher for status quo interest groups to block innovation in decentralized democracies. 
In decentralized democracies, the individual states or provinces can act as test beds. You can try different policy approaches in different places and see what works and what doesn't, rather than imposing it all on the entire country. Uh, all sorts of other arguments. The idea that as states compete, for those innovative industries and companies, they're going to lower taxes and make more friendly regulatory environments. And they're going to compete with one another so the entire nation will become more friendly to innovators. Uh, the idea that you can customize uh, innovation policy by states so that uh, Massachusetts can do research in stem cell technology that my home state of Georgia would never permit. And we can get involved in agricultural research that Texas wouldn't care about. And California can do alternative energy stuff that Texas would never permit. So you can sort of get that sort of uh, state by state policy matching, matching. And finally, the idea that local governments and policymakers simply have better information and know what works better in their state or county or city better than some bureaucrat way off in the capital. Sounds great, right? Problem is, just doesn't show up in the data. So here is just one, and this has been tested again and again and again with all sorts of different case studies and data. This is just one way of looking at it. This is our patent measure, and this is how innovated the countries become uh, in the 1970 to 2012 period. So this is change in innovation rate on the x-axis. And then this is one measure of political decentralization on the y-axis. So this is change in decentralization on the y-axis. Now, if more, as countries decentralize, they innovated more, the data should all line up on a nice diagonal line. But it doesn't. All the data lines up on the crosshairs, except for Israel, South Korea, Taiwan. Right? We have countries that decentralized or centralized the most with little or no change in their innovation rate. And countries with the biggest changes in their innovation rate had no change in their political decentralization. And perhaps the canary on the coal mine is this guy right here, Spain. Spain, during this period, Spain went from a fascist dictatorship to a decentralized democracy with little or no change in its relative innovation rate. And you could say, OK, that's over 42 years. Really, you need longer to set up these institutions, to change all the actors and incentives. So we can go to this slide. This is some of the oldest democracies in the world that have grouped into low income, middle income, and wealthy. Now, clearly, the wealthy economies are more innovative. We can just look that, at that and, and see. Uh, and that makes sense, because innovation creates wealth, and you need wealth for innovation, so it's a virtuous circle. But we've got democracies that have been around since uh, 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 tw 100 years, and Costa Rica is still not an innovative economy. right? You could say, oh, well, Costa Rica is really small. Well, so are Switzerland and Sweden, but they're innovating like crazy. We've got New Zealand, which is. Uh, been a democracy for, what is that, 125 years, 50 years, right? And they're still not in it. They're a mid-level, a low mid-level innovator. You can say, well, they're far away from everything. Well, Costa Rica is right next door to the most innovative country in the world. And we can go through all these different debates on these different uh, uh, countries. And I'm not saying democracy doesn't matter. It does. Uh, if you haven't tried it, I highly recommend it. I'm a big proponent of democracy. I'm saying that democracy achieves a lot of things, but innovation is not necessarily one of them. So after this time of, of, of all these frustrations, I decided to go take a look and say, well, OK, why are these theories failing us? Uh, because as good social scientists, we think about innovation in terms of market failures, you know, all these monopolies blocking new innovators, or dealing with uh, the spillovers uh, in public goods of sci new science and research, so, or status quo interest groups that get in there and block. Uh, their competition, their innovative competition. And that's the answer to these are all these policies and institutions that we all come up with and say these solve these problems and create more innovative economies. So why isn't this working? So what I decided to do is take a look at four cases, two of relative uh, high success, one mid-level case, and one case of relative uh, failure. My apology to any guests or uh, viewers from Mexico, wonderful country, uh, amazing people, just terrible at innovation, in a rel relatively speaking. Uh, the star uh, over Taiwan is in respect to our viewers from uh, 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 Taiwan and China. Uh, again, one, one part, one, one, we see this as one state, but from this perspective, Taiwan acts like an independent unit because it has its own institutions and policies that it operates by. So why were these more innovative than Ireland, and Ireland more so than Mexico? When you get deep into what these countries were doing, yes, we see Taiwan and Israel creating those institutions and policies that we associate with 
innovation and investing in them much more so than Ireland and Ireland doing so much more so than Mexico creating the universities the research labs uh, the patent and private uh, private uh, uh, intellectual property rights etc Ireland less so in Mexico barely at all but we also find that what Taiwan and Ireland are doing much more so than Ireland and Mexico is networking so give a good map of this what Taiwan and and um, Israel were doing I'm sorry I misspoke is actively the governments were actively bringing together science technology engineer the science labor force together over particular science technology problems and then providing with them with resources and then networking them in with people in the business world not just uh, entrepreneurs starting business but the finance world distribution marketing to solve all those problems that it takes that that it uh, they have to solve in order to take a product from the laboratory to the market so let me give you just one example from Israel. So Israel in the late 60s decides that it wants to get into uh, science and technology and become a more competitive economy. Previous to this period, it is an agricultural state, quasi-socialist, so not what you would expect. You would not have been betting your money on Israel. So what do they do? They create within the military highly elite units where the best and brightest in science and technology are brought together over particular technology problems often associated with computing or weapon systems like nuclear weapons. And then as they develop their in-house science and technology, they spit them out into the private sector where they start their own companies, often partly funded or with grants from the government. And then after years of developing these companies, they bring some of the high people back into government to work on science, technology, competitiveness policy, and then circulate them back out. So you've got the circulation of flow where people out in the business world know what government can and will do to help them and people in government understand what's going on out there in the private sector and how they can help. Taiwan we see, uh, oh sorry let me continue the Israel story. So by the time we get into the 1980s Israel is beginning to produce fairly competitive science and technology but they're not selling it very well on the world markets because they don't get that. They know their S&T in the domestic market but they don't get international markets. So what do they do? The government actively helps them to network out into the Jewish communities in the United States, in around Silicon Valley, and especially around New York. So they go, they not only go out to meet with these people, but also to bring them back as consultants, as board members, uh, as joint ventures, to bring back their knowledge of how to tap into international financial markets, how to market your products on the global economy. So that by the time when we get into the 1990s, Israel is not only uh, producing uh, fantastic S&T within the domestic economy, but is a world-class competitor. Back by the 1990s, uh, you've heard of the NASDAQ stock market. That's where all the tech, stock, uh, tech companies go to do their IPOs. By the 1990s, Israel is the second most listed nation on the NASDAQ. The United States is first, Israel is second. I believe Canada is probably third uh, during that time period. And we can hear similar stories in Taiwan. Ireland does this less. It builds great roads, telecommunications infrastructure, very good schools, great high quality labor, and then says, Hope we built it, hopefully they'll come. And a lot of foreign companies do come to set up uh, 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 a presence in Ireland, but mostly as an export base. So you do see some growth in innovation here, but still not a whole lot of indigenous innovation. It's mostly supporting, not leading. Mexico doesn't do this networking at all, despite the fact that it's right next to the most innovative country in the world. So this is a good uh, point to stop and take questions, comments, or no, you got this wrong. I'm happy to take obje objections. I'm an academic, so I get it all the time. Everyone's polite in Washington. We're not, so feel free to beat up. Great. Thank you, Zach. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so one thing you didn't talk about that when I read your book, I seem to recall, and it was this notion of, uh, well, I th first of all, I love the part where you're talking about it, that, that building these networks, essentially these innovation ecosystems is really a key sort of circulation. The question is why? And I, and you, I think, maybe skipped over it, which right. is threat right? and perceived threat. So do you want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. So the missing question is, okay, so you answered how countries innovate, but you still haven't said why. Why do some countries set up these networks uh, and institutions and policies, but not others? And the argument in the book is that um, S&D is controversial. It creates winners and losers. We think everyone benefits, but every dollar you spend 
on science and technology is a dollar you're not spending on infrastructure, on welfare, on tax cuts, or going into the pockets of some politicians somewhere. So people lose out from investments in S&T. People also lose out from the S&T itself, right? New science and technology uh, can eliminate older and existing jobs, even entire industries. So we can think of alternative energy. We can think of the automated uh, car that's coming out. We can think of all the people who are going to be hurt by this. And these people love science and technology. They think it's great, except for that technology that's hurting them, their job, their assets, their company. And they will go to their politicians and say, hey, you've got to tax that. You've got to regulate that. You need to stop subsidizing it. It's dangerous for the economy. It's dangerous for our culture. It's dangerous to our jobs. And you'll buy a 1,000 pinpricks, come up with this domestic opposition to new technology. And what we see out there is countries which feel a great sense of external threat, like, my goodness, we need to develop this technology in order to compete economically, in order to afford the food, energy, even the weapons we need to defend ourselves, we need this s and we're not going to be able to compete. They're able to over, overcome those domestic forces. But in cases where there isn't much, and that's what we see in Taiwan and Israel, uh, cases where we don't see it in Mexico, this country is wealthy in natural resources. It has no credible threats on any of its borders. Its main competition is different groups within Mexico that see each other as their economic competitors. So they're like, why shouldn't we give money to S&T? How am I going to benefit? No, I want, my, uh, I want my welfare or my tax breaks. And they don't see the reason to invest in this risky S&T. After all, they can just import it, import it with all the oil money they're, they're making. Is that a good short Yeah, summary? that's a great short. So if you use that framing to think about the US in the, really in the 19th century, what was our threat? Our threat was really this view that we wanted to be the leading country in the world and there was sort of a nation building ethos of across the parties, uh, what, especially once the Civil War sort of solved the, this internal right. conflict of sort of rent seeking agriculturalists versus growth and innovation based industrialists, it sort of just amazingly took up. And then when we got to the 40s, the threat obviously was the, was the Cold War. Uh, you know, it's striking to me that we spend less on R&D now than prior to Sputnik as a share of GDP. So Sputnik comes along, everybody knows that story. We all freak out, bipartisan. We really put the pedal to the metal. And then really ever since uh, you know, the late 80s, the 90s, it's sort of what is that threat to us? And I feel like we've drifted in the 90s and the 2000s and just kind of went along. And, and now we may be getting to this point where there's a new threat, obviously China. Right. But we don't haven't really responded to that yet because the other thing I see in the US is, is this point about I think we've gotten into this world where the idea that you would support a technology that would eliminate a job is seen as heretical now. Uh, you know, there's so much opposition now to autonomous trucks, for example. Right. If you look at the Senate bill, for example, on autonomous vehicles, it exempted autonomous trucks because the Teamsters did not want to be right. losing their job. Right. That's very different overall from the U.S. story. The U.S. story was always about, we're sorry, but you can't stand in the way of progress. And I'd just be curious, what, you, how do you think about that? Do you, do you think that's right? I think we see it, we definitely see it in the uh, science spending data. We do see U.S. investment in ba basic R&D dropping off after the Cold War ends. And maybe that's a leading indicator. Maybe we'll begin to see this opposition uh, come up. You do see it in some of the anti-science attitudes of some people in Congress saying, why are we funding this ridiculous research when it could be going towards tax breaks or infrastructure or this other stuff? So we do see this play out. In the last chapter of the book, I, I do do make a brave move and try and make some predictions. Most social scientists are much smarter than me and they don't make any predictions. Uh, but I say, okay, look, if we really believe this, here's what we should see in 50 years. And I've got a nice chart of all the countries that we should be seeing as highly innovative, less innovative, and, and, and uh, maybe some surprises. And I think we'll do well because of this sense of, of threat from China. Uh, but I wouldn't be surprised if I was wrong the other way because we do begin to see this uh, anti-technology, uh, uh, technology is seen as a source of problems often as much as a solution. And will various political groups and interest groups take advantage of that? And they're not bad people, they're just fighting for what they uh, want. I think China may also be a surprise, because I feel that China has uh, fewer real external threats 
than it tries to communicate, and much more in potential internal divisions among different uh, uh, groups within China. So China, as it ages and the demographics shift uh, and they have to deal with all this, China might become less innovative than we think it's going to be. See, I think the threat in China is this memory that they all have about mm -hmm. imperial aggression and, 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 and dependency. I mean, that's, when I, I, I visited museums in China, and they're, it, it's almost like they're ashamed. They, they feel it's a national sense of shame that they were taken advantage of by these imperials. And I'm like, I, you know, if somebody has a gun to your head and you don't have any gunpowder, not, there's nothing shameful about having to give in to that. It's just was, is what it was. But they, in their minds, have, believe that really, yeah. really strongly. And I think it drives a lot. Now, whether the next generation of Chinese who grew up on YouTube or whatever, you know, whatever else they're watching over there right. sort of ignores that, I don't know. Uh, I, I was escorted around to a museum the last time I was in Shenzhen by this young 25-year-old woman guide. And I was talking to her. When we get to the end of the museum, <clears throat> you start at the, the shellfish thing of Shenzhen 10,000 years ago, and it ends up with and in between, you see the Portuguese oppressing them, the British oppressing them, the Americans oppressing them, the Japanese. And, and, um, and, and I said, uh, how do you feel about that? And she was pretty upset about it all. Yeah. And so I, I don't know how, how that might play out. No, I think, that's, I think that's dead on. And the degree that they can keep that mindset going will help them make the sacrifices and, and bear the costs of uh, yeah. investing. Yeah. But they have a, similar, a much worse problem than we have uh, is this aging population that needs to be taken care of. And the, you know, that population does not feel they get a whole lot from big investments in S&T and education that they may never see during their lifetimes. They'd much rather have their health care and their uh, easy, nice retirement now. Uh, and that costs a lot of money. I mean, one of the, uh, the other, uh, when you look at some of your countries, I mean, there, there is an argument, uh, although I remember somebody, uh, uh, when I was on a panel on, on, on Korea, this guy made the argument. He thought dictatorship was, <laughs> was very positive for innovation. Uh, if you're in the right sort of stage of development, because yeah. what the Korean, uh, maybe dictatorship is the wrong word, but uh, you know, single party authoritarian rule in Korea. Yep. You know, Taiwan same, as well. Same thing in Taiwan. Yep. Singapore. Singapore. Yep. Uh, you know, in, in, in South America, those dictatorships used it for self aggrandizement. And, in, in, and those authoritarian regimes in, in the Asian tigers use them to basically tell people, I'm sorry, but we're going to impoverish you for another generation yeah. or two. You're yeah. not going to get what you want because we're making all of these, we're putting all this capital into the future. Um, that's what China's doing now, and I guess yeah. the question is, can they keep doing it? I do think, I don't think this explains everything. I think this is a big missing piece when you look at, you know, uh, public policy, economic, even political science studies of innovation and S&T. They tend to ignore the international and the networking aspect. So one point of the book is, hey, there's stuff going on here. But I don't think this explains everything. I do think that leadership matters. There's a certain amount of luck. I do think culture matters in the background because culture, to a certain degree, tells us what gives us status, right? And if achievement as an entrepreneur in science technology gives us status, a lot of young people will go into it. If it's more about religion or sports uh, or the arts, uh, they'll choose that because sometimes status not only provides wealth, sometimes it beats wealth as an end goal for a lot of people. Yeah, I mean, like Latin America, where the status is to become a PhD political scientist. Yes, yes. Not a PhD <laughs> physicist. <laughs> You'd be a high, high level. Right. But in Mexico, you see where they invest in education. It's much higher in the social science and humanities yeah. than it is in science and engineering. Right. right. So one last question that I want to open up with you, all to you. Um, is that I really like the book. I find it very enlightening. But... Um, how do you explain Europe? Because, you know, uh, it's one, you know, European Commission, you know, right. 27 countries. And, you, and you've got Spain and Finland that do really well. And then and, and it's, I mean, sorry, uh, Sweden and Finland. Now, you could say the threat is that if they don't innovate, they're going to freeze to death. And right. Maybe that's the threat. But how do you, how do you, con how does your theory sort of explain Europe, diversion in Europe, divergence in Europe? So I haven't gotten into uh, a whole, every, country case study, some on purpose because you want to save them so it doesn't sort of affect your mind. But the best question is f Finland. What is the threat in uh, Finland sure. going on there? So there I actually dug a little bit because it really seems strange to me because it's such a takeoff. So, and I haven't gone deep, but from what I can tell, prior, during the Cold War, uh, Finland was stuck between the NATO forces and the Soviet. And the sort of, the, the sort of implicit deal was both sides will leave you alone 
as long as there's no reason to drag them in. So as long as everyone's happy in Finland, there's no mass protest riots on the street, domestic upheaval, everyone will leave you alone. So there was a lot of uh, pressure on the Finnish government to uh, 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 keep equality, relative equality, as a high priority. And innovation upsets that op apple cart. As we see the Cold War fade away and the emergence of the EU, suddenly Finland has to innovate. And they begin to, this is the threat because they're not going to be able to afford, they're not earning the, enough foreign exchange to afford all the things their economy needs. So then you see a tremendous switch within the government and among the elites within the Finnish economy saying, hey, we need to get involved in more science and technology. And the Finnish takeoff is not just, uh, is it Ericsson or Nokia? I forget which one is Finland and Sweden. Okay. It's not just telecom. If you look at the patenting, the science and technology uh, research publications, it's across the board. And you see the investments being made, the networks being created. Uh, so there is that sort of sense out there. It doesn't have to be a military threat. It can be a sense of economic threat, whereas we need to earn this money if we're going to buy those things our society needs. Great. Okay, good. Uh, questions? If you want to just identify yourself and uh, say who you're with. And Sam, we'll start off. Uh, wait for the mic, please. Hi, Sam Baldwin with the Department of Energy. Um, one of the things in reading your book that I didn't really see enough of was um, the issue of networking, metrics for networking, the underlying statistics for analyzing those metrics for networking, and also the whole issue of metrics for the effectiveness of networking. And I wondered if uh, you're doing any further work on that or what you might point towards for uh, looking at those issues. Um. I don't know. There's a good chapter on networking to sort of uh, provide a snapshot of what's been going on in the findings. But I'm not a social network uh, researcher. But I know that there's a handful at University of Toronto that have gone into this. Dan Bresnitz up there um, at Carnegie Mellon has a good group. Erica Fuchs, F-U-C-H-S, over there. Um, I'm trying to think of some others, but I can talk afterwards. So yeah, there are, I mean, networking is a big, there's a lot of sociology people. UC Davis, I want to say Fred Block is another, who've been looking into uh, networking and its effect on S&T competitiveness. So there is a huge field in that. I'm more observer than I am participant on that particular uh, subfield. And Marianne Feldman at UNC yes. Chapel yep. Hill yep. is also been doing a bunch of work on that. Yeah, Peter. My name is Peter Fatoning. I'm working for the EU delegation here in Washington. I, I, I really appreciate and would like to thank you for that conversation we're having because it, it needs quite some energy diving into such a complicated topic, so I know it very well. Um, I, I wonder what your views are on what is the relationship in perhaps in some selected countries between regulation and innovation because that's something, maybe I missed it in your, in your talk, but I didn't feel it came out strongly. Right, so regulation would have been on that first set of domestic innovate, uh, 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 policies and institutions. And I think regulation can hurt or help, and it depends upon, it, it's conditional. So I don't have a, a short, sweet answer for that. We can think of uh, instances where regulation has helped. For example, if you're raising emission standards for automobiles, that forces com uh, companies to innovate on alternative energy cars or pollution technologies. But we can also think of regulations that have kept businesses from investing new in new areas. So I think you'd have to look regulation by regulation uh, and the politics around that. So that, that's, my short answer is it's, it's, it's too complicated for a quick short answer. Also on design too, uh, in general, if you're doing performance-based regulation, it has more innovation benefits than if you're doing technology-based regulation. Um, for those of you who are interested in that, uh, David Hart on our staff is doing a big, massive report for NSF on the, what does all the literature on regulation and innovation say, and that report should be coming out in the next two months, something like that. Yeah, so. uh, right up here in the front. Hi, my name is Izzy with the Consumer Technology Association. We run CES. And so one question I had in the race for 5G, how do you predict that factor uh, shaping innovation of countries 
which might leap because of it, because they get to 5G first, because they get to market. So I was wondering if you have any thoughts on that. I, I don't, I'm not a specialist on any particular industry or technology. There's some that I, I know more than others because I've stumbled across them or used them in my case studies, but I'm not in particular on 5G. More, rather, I'm looking at sort of the background conditions. What are governments doing or why? Because just because they're putting in some good policies or institutions, doesn't mean they're going to use them for innovation. So you may, some country may say, we're going to invest a billion dollars on 5G research. Well, they may give it to some political appointee who spends it on his buddies or her buddies and, you know, nice, uh, nice trips to conferences, but not a whole lot of competitive research. So anyone ask, what's the politics? And the question, and my answer is that where there's a real sense of, wow, we need to compete in this area or we're going to lose out big, then you'll get more serious use of these policies and institutions. Hopefully that, that answers somewhat. In, you know, re related to that, I wonder if, if just the uh, very idea or recognition that countries are in competition matters. Um, do you see that? Because I know there's a, there's a, there's a fair amount of, I, I would say, the U.S. economics, economist class that denies that competition is real. And Paul Krugman says countries don't compete. Right. Uh, I can't imagine a Taiwanese official who doesn't think that Taiwan is competing with the rest of the world. Right. But I don't know, have you seen that at all? That, 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 that these countries that sort of have an existential threat, they really think about the world from a competitive lens? I think they do. I think competition matters. And it's competition in this broader uh, sense. In the last book, I say, okay, here's what I think, how, how to think about it. And I don't say it in the book, but I realize I finally got a good catchword, which is prepare and compete. Uh, you don't want to let the you don't want to sit around and wait for the free market to throw some innovation and economic growth your way. Governments need to be investing in science, technology, education, all these good things that we associate with an innovative economy. But they need to be putting these actors into competition, not shielding them from it. You think of it like a sports team, right? You take the best people from around the country, you put them in the gym with the best trainers and the best diets, and then you turn them loose to, to compete on the playing field, right? You don't shield them from competition amongst each other or out there on the field. So you do, you, you, the government helps to prepare them and get them into competition. And I think that's what we need to be uh, doing. And that's what I worry about the sort of more uh, libertarian side is that we see a lot of very free market economies that don't wind up being competitive in S&T. Uh, I'm just random order. We'll go here, here, and then here. Hey, Zach. Uh, my name is Jay, Jay Mohan. Um, I'm an adjunct faculty at the business school here at George Mason. Uh, there was recently a story which said uh, a lot of successful cryptocurrency entrepreneurs had moved to Puerto Rico in a town and trying to define the policies and set up, you know, how the innovation should work there. So do you see that as, you know, with the networked world, where rather than the government setting the policies, the, the reverse way where the entrepreneurs would move in and they start defining uh, policies and, you know, would that create friction and is that better or do you have? I think in the early stages, the entrepreneurs will know better often what policies will work for them. Problem is, if they're in control, as those firms mature and become the big players, if they're still controlling the policy, they're going to control it to prevent any competition. So I'm fine with uh, uh, young industries playing much more of a policy role. But as they get older, government needs to make sure that it's clearing the playing field so that newcomers can come in and, and, and compete with these guys. I think uh, there was a question here. Yeah. I'm from and also with the Consumer Technology Association. Um, if I'm understanding your graphs correctly, the y-axis the whole time was uh, patents per capita. So that's kind of like your... It's patents per capita weighted by forward citations. In the same way that if you write a big uh, uh, journal article in, I don't know, cancer research, if it really has an impact, lots of people will cite it in future research. Okay. If it's not, it won't get cited. So it's patents per capita to account for size, weighted by forward citation. Okay, but that's the basically backbone that you're weighting against, like as you look at the different theories. In, it's kind in, of in the size that I've shown. In yeah. the book, I go through a bunch of other measures. Okay. I just didn't want to you know, confuse okay. people with all these measures. Um, well, maybe that kind of changes my question, but I'm just wondering why you use that as your main measure of what is innovative, like especially thinking of the US system and software patents, I would not think that that's the best measure of innovation. So what other um, sort of y-axis did you right. have? 
So again, there's a, there's a considerable discussion in the book in two appendices and half a chapter and how do you go about measuring innovation. Mm -hmm. uh, there are good things and bad things about patents. The short answer is patents work best when you use them in big groups. So for an entire country over the decades. Mm -hmm. They work worse if you go micro. So if I was looking at a particular researcher at University of Minnesota versus another one in, uh, in University of Florida in 1973 versus 1983, patents aren't gonna, that doesn't work very well. Uh, or a co particular company in the given years. So the larger the group that you use them, the more accurate they do. And the reason we feel confident about it is it tends to correlate with other things that we'd expect from an innovative economy like productivity rates and high-tech exports and the rest. And it's hard to find countries that are highly innovative that don't show up where we would expect them to in that patent measure, right? There's no secret biotech industry in Botswana that's not showing up in the patent and no insult to Botswana. I just pulled that out of the, out of the air. Um, you know, one interesting thing I think, uh, and Peter, you probably know about this, the European Commission, I think, has the best uh, measurement system in the world for measuring innovation in firms. Yeah. They've gone way beyond just inputs like R&D and, and intermediate outcomes like patents. So they actually ask firms what share of your sales this year are from a product that, what, or a service that wasn't there five years ago, et cetera, et cetera. U.S. has started to do that a little bit. I don't think we do it as well as Europe. Um, but it'd be really nice if we could get that as the international, at least OECD standard, so that we all. I mean, one of the problems is that the U.S. If you compare U.S. to Europe on this, we actually don't look very innovative, and it, it isn't because we're not. It's because of the survey design differences, and uh, we, we. So I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. It, can, can we move to much better? To your point about software yeah. patenting. There are all these other things that patents don't pick up, R&D doesn't yeah. pick up. I don't think you're ever going to get a good uh, objective measure of innovations for two reasons. One, it's hard to observe as it happens. Right now, somewhere in the world, the next big advance in cancer research is happening, and we have no idea, and no one's except the person who's doing it. Uh, and maybe they don't even know. Uh, so it's impossible to observe in real time. And the second is that there is, we often know something is innovative only years or decades later. So the example I use in the book is a transistor, right? Now considered the most revolutionary invention of the 20th century, if not, you know, part one of human history. When it was invented, uh, it didn't show up in the papers for nine months, and then it showed up at the back of the New York Times in the radio section, the tenth of ten short stories, and no one cared. And the reason was there were already vacuum tubes that essentially did the same thing. And the transistor itself was a sort of, it, was, it fit on a desktop, and if someone slammed the door, it would change the readout. It was only over years of development and diffusion, first into hearing aids, and then radios, and then computers, that people go, oh, wow, now this is the most, now this is amazing. So you often don't know what's innovative until after it's been applied. I'm sure there are all sorts of innovations right now that people are going, this is the next big thing, like Bitcoin. Uh, and 20 years ago, we'll be laughing about it. Or 20 years from now, we'll be laughing about it. So that's, that's why it's, you got, so I would use multiple different measures. If you're going to get into this, get a few different measures and see if they're all pointing in the same direction, and that, that helps. Go over here. Thank you. Alex Temple, uh, State Department. I'm wondering um, if higher education is competing with, with tech transfers and like within U.S. and, and internationally, how, uh, if they're getting engaged with trying to be uh, um, pushed for innovation with their own countries, or if they're just sticking to research with their, themselves? So there's a huge cottage industry multiple on what, what's the role of the university. So yes, there are lots of incentives for individual faculty members and universities themselves to not just do basic science, but to get patentable inventions out of this and push them out into uh, the private market. Uh, there's also a lot of recent research on what happens when lead universities uh, in the West team up with universities in the developing world. And what kind of research are they doing? Uh, is one taking advantage of the other? Where are the flows of knowledge and resources going? Because these, in, it, this is really flowered. There have been now hundreds of these in the last few years. Uh, at Georgia Tech, we have groupings with Lorraine, MIT is doing them with Shanghai, all over the place. Uh, and what we're finding is the developing world wants the prestige and the knowledge base of the lead universities in the West. 
and they will pay for that. So they'll come forward with all sorts of resources for salaries and transportation and uh, laboratories and buildings uh, if these top universities will come set up shop there. So there's a big, dyna a big dynamic. There's not a lot of people looking at this, but it's definitely changing the, the environment around innovation, university innovation. Yeah, well, particularly given the fact that the average amount of uh, funding to university research in the U.S. is now 23rd in the world uh, in terms of per GDP. Oh, really? Yeah, huh. the study we did. And it's been going down uh, in part because of state funding uh, declines. Pri the privates are more or less okay, but the states like Georgia Tech, I don't know what you're... Uh, actually, you have had cuts. Uh, we have, we yeah. have. And you know, throughout the country, universities are getting less and less government support, and that's one of the reasons that tuitions and fees are, are going up, among others, because that's where they're going to compensate. Yeah. Uh, right here in the front uh, row. Um, Scott Winship, I'm with the Joint Economic Committee. Um, so there's a group, the Economic Innovation Group, uh, that's shown that uh, innovation within the United States is concentrated increasingly in just a few places. Um, how do the hypotheses about uh, that try to explain cross-national variation in innovation do if you look at sub-national, you know, interstate variation, things like that? Right. That, that's the I haven't gone there, but that's the next step, right? Uh, what determines how countries uh, specialize? And I have no answer for you because I've not looked into that yet. But that's sort of the next step on this research. Well, I think the other point of Scott's question is, is, is there, you know, your theory at the, at the national level is sort of, you know, some, the, the more threatened right. you feel, the more open you are to change, right. and the more willing you're willing to make those investments in those institutional change. Do you see that playing out at the, at the U.S. level? Uh, you know, for example, we do this thing called the State New Economy Index. We rank states essentially on innovation. Massachusetts is always number one. Right. Mississippi is always number 50. Uh, I don't know if Massachusetts feels any more existential threat than Mississippi. Uh, but uh, you see, cause there, is big, there are big differences. And you, you, you see any of this sort of playing I do out? At the state, and I haven't gone to the state level because there's lots of great state-by-state -state patent data. And you could look at it even uh, uh, city by city. But I do think you see this. I know in the South, that uh, funding for education is often under stress because a lot of people have historical animosities they see as this as going between ethnic and class groups and they don't want their tax dollars going for that person over there even if it's for education because they see it as all a bunch of, 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 of baloney um, or it's subsidizing some group that to truly doesn't deserve it. So I do see these, these uh, uh, tensions at the state level. Uh, it occurs to me that one answer I can give on the global level is that countries can no longer do what Taiwan or Japan did in the 70s and 80s because we now have these global supply chains. So you can't suddenly leapfrog in to be a cutting edge computer maker, or aerospace, et cetera, without a tremendous amount of investment because we've already got these established, uh, not just national, but international uh, firms. So if you are Brazil or Argentina, who wants to suddenly innovate, it's, you need to find your niche. So in these countries, they folk, they're thinking about, okay, how do we innovate in the natural resource space or the agricultural space? Because that's one area that Taiwan or the U.S. aren't looking in particularly. So that is one sub-industry that you can sort of look at. Yeah, I mean, there is, I think it's interesting to think about because I got my Ph.D. from Chapel Hill, and so I was pretty aware of sort of the political economy of when they formed the triangle, which was really in the sort of 50s and 60s. And it was one of those things where you've got South Carolina and North Carolina right next to you. They, they should both be. But there was something about the North Carolina leadership where they they just felt under stress. And they, they were like, we are, you know, we're, we're falling behind. Our per capita income is 35% of the national. We can't accept this. And we've got to break out. And so the, the triangle was a real breakout move for them that South Carolina, to use an example, never did. Right. And so that, to me, was related to this stress or this outside. It was just that they perceived it and South Carolina didn't. I think it's there. I haven't, like I say, I haven't done the state by state, but I do see it uh, when you look at different states and how they're embracing or distancing themselves from this. Uh, I just haven't gone to take a look at the dynamics. Yeah. 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 I mean, there's a, Dan Elazar, does that ring any bells? It does. Yeah, so Dan Elazar is a famous political scientist. He ranked states by sort of three types of political cultures. One was uh, what he called moralistic, which 
sounds more than it is, but it's basically you believe in good government and uh, everybody, and then they're individualistic states where it's sort of rent-seeking. So New Jersey, you can guess what they are. Uh, Massachusetts and Minnesota and Utah are moralistic, and, and, and then he calls traditionalistic states, where it's really about the elites, and, and that oftentimes is south. But the key, I think, in North Carolina was the elites moved beyond that sort of self-dealing of just helping the, the textile firms and the furniture magnates to saying we wanted to leapfrog something else. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yes, right here in the front. Also, one thing, Scott, on that, we have a report, which is on our, I can send it to you, Your Honor, where we, um, in fact, my colleague John Wu uh, did this. <laughs> we went and looked at uh, a whole slew of indicators for every congressional district in the country on high-tech startups, uh, how many scientists and engineers, how many technology firms. And it's not as bad as Economic Innovation Group says. There's a lot going on everywhere. Certainly, it's, there's some concentration, but there's a lot of innovation in a lot of places in the U.S. Yeah. Right here. I have one fun question, perhaps. Uh, one is, how do you th are you willing to make any bets on Brexit? What do you think the economic fallout from the EU and how that might impact their maybe forward leap towards being more innovative? Um, and the second one is, you mentioned, did you measure trade? You, you had the three in, columns in your book. Did you in look some, at trade? In the book, there is some, I do look at high-tech exports as one measure of how an innovative country is, which is tough because some countries are not necessarily innovating on the stuff they're exporting. But you can use that as one measure of innovation. Uh, I do think trade uh, matters, but it can both help and hurt. So if I were advising uh, you know, Argentina or Brazil or some newly formed country how to be more innovative, I would actually say you don't want a free trade until you can compete. You want to be more like Japan. Seal yourself off, put your domestic firms in competition with another, with each other and subsidize them so that they're really building up and then once they're got their muscles then open up to free trade. I think that when Mexico opened up to free trade before it was ready to compete, Mexico actually had a budding computer industry back in the 1970s and then it opened it up to free trade and the American firms just came in and wiped them out um, and to the degree that there had been a ba any remaining computer industry when China entered the WTO with its inexpensive labor force, all the computer makers uh, then moved to China and left Mexico with nothing. So free trade definitely works if you are a large, wealthy lead innovator. So that's us. And it's distressing to me that we might be moving back from that because we win from free trade. It's designed to benefit us more than anyone else. Um, but if you're a new in economy that's not yet innovating, it's probably not great for you. Yeah, I guess I, I'd have a little bit different take on that, uh, Zach, because if you look at a country like Brazil, which, which did a different model than, right. than Mexico, Brazil was about import substitution. And the problem, I think, with an innovation economy that we're in today, you really have to have either global scale in what you're innovating, or you have to have global supply chains. It's really hard to sort of figure and be an innovative leader on a, a sort of autarkic, localized economy. China might be able to do it. Right. Brazil just can't do it. So. Brazil sort of picked the worst of both worlds, I think, as they, they did this import substitution thing which protected their companies and they got lazy and they weren't able to go out. And, so I don't know, is there, is there some I, I sweet feel spot? what Latin America got wrong, but what East Asia got right is the East Asians uh, put their companies often in competition with another, with each other, whereas in Latin America it be, they got, you know, fat and lazy. They got wealthy on, on government handouts and they didn't have any need to compete. Um, and a lot of them had a lot of natural resources on which they could depend uh, for income anyway. So there wasn't that sense of we need these companies really to get out there, whereas in yeah. East Asia they did. Yeah, um, yeah sorry, go on. Okay. Yeah, um, yeah you, again, Br Brazil's a tough case because they have innovated, they have a good aerospace uh, industry, and they have made investments in, in other areas. And they're a large enough economy where they could pull it off if they were willing to make the trade-offs necessary to create a domestically co competitive economy. But right now, uh, the politics are so poisonous, they just see each other as, as the enemy. Yeah. Um, so yeah. that's real tough. So on the, on the Brexit question, um, there's an interesting thing to speculate on, because the UK is now going to be more sort of forced into their own devices. Um, and also, you know, at least when we look at the UK, uh, they're not Thatcherites anymore. They might have been Thatcherites, but but even uh, the conservative governments, past two conservative governments, been very very much about sort of Schumpeterians, not not Thatcherites. And uh, 
I look at that as saying that decline is a motivator. When you when you fall deep enough, right. eventually you realize we got to do something different, and, and, and you motivate. So the, the, I see the UK is really, you know, they're making a lot of steps. They're they're, they're building these networks. They're investing. I mean, do you think that decline is also a motivator in that broad sense? I mean, I look at it as a sort of classic globalization. Some groups got wealthy and others didn't, and these guys were behind the, the Brexit uh, movement and behind, to a certain degree, the Trump uh, movement within the United States. But A, when it first happened, I said there's no way this actually happens because the losses are just so huge. And I'm still kind of hopeful for that. But if they do, um, it'll be a bad period, I think, especially if other countries start splitting off from the EU. I think that they will fall behind in s and if they start breaking up these networks. Uh, and if they can win on something as huge as Brexit, then it's really easy to win on funding for s and uh, research innovation. Uh, so I, I, would, I would, it would strike me that things would get a lot worse for countries that pursue the Brexit pass. Yeah, except they might be more motivated now. They might be. Uh, again, I'm not advocating Brexit. I'm just right. saying that one of the results is your... I just feel if, if, if these people are the ones who are driving the bus, they'll continue to drive it down the same path. Is is we don't want to fund this stuff in the same way that they, they don't want to bear the costs of, of integration. Okay. I hope I'm wrong. I have been in the past. So. Uh, we'll go uh, right here and then right here. So. Francesca, I'm with a development firm that operates out of uh, DC here, and I'm just wondering if, you, when you're talking about this investments and, and talking about really comprehensive investments by the government into these innovators in their own countries, um, have you looked at, and I apologize, I didn't get a chance to read your book, have you looked at whether or not um, investing in specific parts of the economy has been more effective than others? So you mentioned in Israel, a lot of their focus was on the military. Um, you know, you mentioned that states, uh, state funding for universities is declining, but do we have uh, instances of countries where they've been increasing that funding and that's been more successful for, for them, or um, investing specifically in the private sector, like the industry leaders or potentially SMEs, are any one of those more effective than the other, and is any specific type of investment more effective than others? I think, no, I think as long as you're investing substantially, and creating some competition around those investments, uh, it should produce a more innovative economy. Because countries take such different paths to success that I think they've got a lot of latitude into how to customize it. So yeah, I did not see any silver bullets, but they do have to invest. That's, they, do have, they do have to do it. They need to solve those market failures. and, and so I thought there were two silver bullets in, in, in your piece. And one was invest in a way that doesn't create these silos where everybody's off on their own. Invest in a way that builds networks. Right, right. So that's different. You could invest in silos, or you could invest in enable. Oh, oh, from that perspective, okay, sure. Yeah, I just didn't. I, I didn't think of there is a particular model you have to follow, or you must invest in military research uh, type of thing. You must have the top universities type of thing. That's one way. But yeah, I agree. You got to create the networks. You got to solve the market failures. Yeah. Uh, yeah, right here, sorry. Hi, I'm Maria Lundberg. I'm the Science and Innovation Officer with the Embassy of Sweden. Uh, I was wondering if you have looked into universities, as in particular the quantity versus quality. So if it's better to have you know, top-notch researcher and top-notch universities versus having a larger percentage of the population with higher education. Also, just a curiosity, what is your next step? What are you going to look into uh, coming up? Um, so I haven't looked deeply into quality versus quantity. My gut reaction is quality over quantity. It's better to have some really elite, high-performing organizations, whether it's universities or firms or government uh, research labs, etc., because uh, those create the networks that they form can be quite high-performing, whereas a lot of low-quality that seems to happen less, but I haven't done rigorous research that I can say that with my fist panning on the table. Um, but just, just to that point where you answer, the political economy generally leads to low quality. Yeah. 
because everybody wants their own yeah. their yeah. own piece. So again, it goes to your point of if you want to break out of that, it sounds to me like if you want the political economy to be able to make the hard choices, it, 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 that gets you to uh, you know more elite schools or more elite institutions. Right. Yeah, because the, yeah, the politics will want to, to, to spread yeah. it out, yeah. and we see that, and it comes at the expense. And I think I've seen, there's some studies out there on universities, and if you contact me later, I can give you the titles. I have to dig around, but there's some people who have looked at that more than I. Um, but as for next steps, all sorts of the sub, you know, it, by industry, by things by state, I think are important. Uh, I was on a uh, grant recently where we took a look at university, international university linkages and what was going on there. So there's all sorts of great areas to come from uh, this. So I feel like a kid in a candy store uh, to a certain degree. But stay tuned. I'll, I'll, I'll have more stuff coming out soon. And ITIF, by the way, comes out with fantastic studies. All sorts of organizations say they look at science and, and innovation. Most of them just give it lip service. I think ITF, ITIF is one of the few that really digs in deep and comes out with good substantive uh, uh, studies and analysis. Thank you. Right here. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Amber Cassidy. Um, I work for a government relations firm, and I was previously affiliated with the Bertelsmann Foundation, which focuses on transatlantic relations. And I'm curious, of course, your research focuses on competition. Um, but while doing your research, did you see any outlying threads of cooperation in the tech industry among a lot of these countries that you mentioned? Or is it purely competition-based that they expand their tech industries? Can you rephrase the question? Um, are there threads of cooperation between a lot of these nations that you've talked about in their tech industries? Right, yeah, there are definitely, because that's what the networks to a certain degree are all about. Um, as long as the actors in these networks feel a sense of competition with other networks, then good stuff comes out. So one of the implications is, look, as we study bigger and bigger science and technology problems, we get, it was just a study, I should say, global science and technology problems. We encounter global market failures, and we need global investment and global network working on this stuff. Uh, so how do you do that yet maintain a competitive environment is a great question for policy people, and I do not have an answer yet. But using your Israel example, that there was one of those things where you would assume the Israeli uh, folks in the network, obviously they thought they were getting benefit. Obviously, the, you would imagine the U.S. folks thought they were getting yeah. benefit. So it was a combination of putting those two together. Would we want to have networks with the entire world? Maybe not, because the whole point is to get advantage. I, I think we do on those S&T problems that, that create a global threat. Sure. Aging, disease, environment, climate change, energy. These are things that all of humanity says, this is something we got to deal with. So where you have that, where nature gives us an external threat, this is an area where I think we could create the, the, the politics necessary to get the investments and coordination we need. Yeah. I mean, what's striking is we don't have any institutions to play that role right, right. now. You know, we have trade institutions, we have development institutions. We really, isn't, there's no national institution who's charged with thinking, how do we build networks around global innovation right. challenges, which we think is a problem. Um, Sam? No. I was just going to make a quick comment on that. Is the networks, it's not just threads of cooperation. Right, grab the mic. Also, yep. within the country, between competing firms, and one of the things that's interesting is comparing uh, Silicon Valley to Route 128 mm -hmm. and looking at how the creation of those networks was much more um, effective in Silicon Valley primarily because of IBM and Stanford and how they set up those networks through postdocs and, and others. And Silicon Valley has had much more job hopping uh, historically that helped build those networks and provided capabilities, helped uh, create new firms that is now at risk because of the um, you know, labor contracts that they are going towards where they have exclusive controls and really are impeding the movement of, of workers between firms. And do you see that, have you looked at that issue of um, labor contracts and how that impacts uh, things like these networks? I, I haven't, but I recognize it. I feel one of the big economic problems that we're not uh, facing, although some people brought it up, is the degree of licensing you need to do almost anything in the economy. Uh, in, in, in Georgia, I think you need a license to be a florist. 
uh, or to wash people's hair. Uh, and a lot of these licensing requirements have nothing to do with health and safety. They're designed by the group who have jobs to sort of control the supply of labor so that their wages don't go down. And that makes perfect economic sense. They're not bad people. They're just trying to hang on to their way of living. But we need to, get one of the government's job is to create a competitive environment. So there's one place that uh, state and federal government could be getting into to create a more competitive American economy. So I think you're dead on. Yeah. I, I, pardon? They're bad people. <laughs> yeah, they're bad people. Yeah. Uh, I thought that the California did pass a law against that, Sam, recently, but I may be completely, completely mistaken. Yeah, I know that they had a regime that enabled uh, job hopping more than other states. So, yeah. Any other uh, questions or comments? Yes, ma'am. Karen Maples, Future Forward. Um, you mentioned uh, culture as one aspect in your remarks today, and I'm very curious to know at the grassroots level what you see as the implications. So, for example, in Japan and other um, countries in Asia, young people embraced mobile technology very early on, and there was a lot of concern here in the United States that we were going to be behind because of not having the faster standards and the wide usage. And now in the United States, we're seeing pitch competitions. We have Shark Tank. We have hackathons. And so we've ne we're now creating an interesting cultural dynamic here in the United States where a lot more people understand how to come up with an idea and think about the, the business plan aspect of it and how to pitch. And what do you think the implications are for those types of grassroots things in terms of impacting the innovation within a country? So I, th I think they're good because I'm very pro-competition. Uh, and now everything's a competition. You know, there are on TV, there are chef competitions and dancing competitions. Everything's a competition, right? And I kind of like that uh, as long as it's, you know, creatively done and, and that's what they're doing. The people are creating uh, networks and investing in competitors, and I think that's what you need to do. You need to prepare and compete. Um, as far as that being part of the culture, I, I, I think that's a positive thing. I mean, when people are getting so competitive that they're, you know, they're cheating or beating each other up in the streets, then competition has gone too far, right? And that's where government has, wants to create. Um, but on the cultural side, so an interesting side note is that one thing that seems to come up again and again is that more individualistic cultures seem to be more innovative. And you'd think that's coming from the supply side. Like, I want to go be an individualist, so I'm going to go be a scientist, engineer, entrepreneur. But what it, where it might be more powerful is on the consumer side. I want to stand out. I want to compete against my other people, my family, my friends, my coworkers. So I need that new technology, that new car, that new phone with all these new gadgets and stuff. So it could be on the demand side, where individualism is driving some of this innovation. And one other highly individual, uh, other highly innovative cultural trait that we find is ones that are sort of nationally collectivist, where they see themselves, where the country sees itself as this giant group that needs to go and compete with those other giant groups up there. Uh, where collectivism hurts is where it's my, my family, right, or my, my uh, clan, uh, and then you start fighting over resources. So you think about, you know, uh, um, I'm trying to, without being offensive, like the, the stereotypical view of Italy, right? Where it's all about my family and that group, and we're sort of in competition with the other families. We're not thinking about, we don't want to make those big national sacrifices. We're in Japan, you had that, if we're going to survive, we are a national, uh, we're a national society. We need to make the sacrifices, to joint sacrifices for joint national greatness. And there you get very innovative uh, uh, societies. So that's one cultural area where I have looked a little bit into. I wonder if we're moving more towards southern Italy. I hope not. This is this is my concern. Yeah, and we, it looks like that in the politics that we're pursuing. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. No, it's disturbing. I mean, you compare northern Italy to southern Italy, and this was this was uh, this was who did this work? Putnam, Putnam, and then also uh, the end of history, uh, Fukuyama's book Trust, which you've seen, yeah. where he basically says northern southern Italy, there's no trust. <coughs> Why they have the mafia? Uh, and in, you, you want some level of trust. I mean, this combination of individualism combined with trust is a really powerful thing. And yeah. if we're losing one or both of those, it, it could be problematic. Yeah. And it's disturbing when political people at the top 
destroy the very foundations for this great, most innovative economy in history. So hopefully political leaders at the top from all parties will not do this anymore. So just to close, I thought your last point, I mean, all of this has been fascinating, but one of the things I think we suffer from in the U.S. is the one perfect way syndrome, um, and we have it. And I think what you're showing is there are several good ways and there are lots of bad ways. Uh, what's that phrase? It's easier. A hundred ways you can go bad, only one way you can go good, or whatever that is. Yeah. But, uh, uh, and I think that's interesting. And then you dig down underneath it. Why, why is a more collectivist country okay? It's because they can mobilize. Why is a more individualist country has advantages? It's because of incentives. And so it's a combination of mobilization plus incentives, and then not this sort of crony, uh, you know, sort of what we see in art in a place like Argentina where you're fighting over yeah. things. Yeah. Great. Uh, well, please join me in thanking uh, Zach for a great presentation. Thank you. And uh, thank you all for, for attending. And hopefully, uh, if you haven't bought his book yet and read it, you will do that. So, it's only $9 thanks. on Kindle. Uh, and I'll stick around if people have uh, want to talk, have questions, etc.